Have you ever watched a series where a new villain is introduced and completely decimates our heroic forces for the entire episode's runtime, only to miraculously lose in the final hour? Then in the next episode, another powerful force comes, only to never be referenced again. Stories by their nature necessitate a plot, and episodic stories need to contain an entire plot that can be enjoyed without much context into a wider narrative. Hence, the Monster of the Week, a trope that... I think explains itself. Having most of its inspiration found firmly planted within Toku franchises, which live and die by their monsters of the week, Sailor Moon naturally has this trope on full display. These fleeting fiends live and die by three core concepts. Their powers, their originality, and their overall design. Of course, when creating a new villain every single week, some of them end up becoming not so memorable or downright goofy. After all, for every Dora Sphinx, you're bound to get at least five fairy Dondons. And Sailor Moon's villains are no exception. In this series, I wanted to take the time and examine every single one of these momentary monsters by examining their powers, origin of their name, and their overall design. Starting, of course, with the quintessential Sailor Moon monster, the Dark Kingdom's Yoma. Before we begin discussing these cursory creatures, we should first understand their etymology. From a Japanese speaker's point of view, the Dark Kingdom really didn't put in a lot of effort when it came to naming their creations, as the word simply means monster or ghost. While being an apt term to apply to them, it really isn't that invocative to the imagination. Especially considering some of the competition, like Daemons, Lemuress, or even Genus Loci. In terms of design, the Yoma are perhaps the most most wildly varied and interesting of the monsters of the week, with a small handful of them even appearing inside the manga, which is usually the anime's forte. They tend to be a bit on the monstrous side as well, seeming to be actual monsters rather than the character designer's barely disguised fetish. Well, you know, mostly. There's also a handful of masculine monsters, which as the series progresses becomes a rarer occurrence. I will be ranking them based off the three criteria I mentioned earlier, that being their powers, design, and overall presence within their particular episode. With those details out of the way, I present to you the first Yoma. Morga has the distinction of being the first in a lot of regards. She's the first Yoma, and furthermore, the first villain within the entire series. Although never named within the manga, she has the distinction of being present within both adaptations, with very little alteration. While like most Yoma, I'm sure her name serves as some sort of reference to something, to what I honestly couldn't tell you in this particular case. She certainly has a sinister looking design, definitely resembling a demonic presence corrupting a human form. She even has the whole neck rotating thing going on. As far as powers go, she doesn't seem to have anything truly unique going on for her. A handful of other Yoma seem to have the ability to command their victims in some form, and she doesn't do much else other than die. But in terms of presence, she is the first for the series, definitely cementing her as an iconic minion in her own right, with a solid enough design that would have been easily forgettable had it not been the first, securing a B-tier spot. While not the next Yoma within the anime's continuity, Garabin was the second Yoma to appear within the manga, although yet again unnamed and sporting an entirely different design overall, looking somewhat more similar to Morga than her anime counterpart. Anime Garabin has a strikingly different design, however, with blood red skin and body fur. While both seem to have the ability to stationary as weapons, the anime wasn't too big of a fan of her sharp nails, opting to give her an axe for a hand. Her name is derived from a pun from the Japanese word gariben, which means study hard. A fitting name for a yoma disguised as a teacher. Unfitting, however, is the impact this yoma has had compared to Morga. Having two designs makes it harder to remember this particular yoma for its own merits, rather than the fact that Usagi didn't know how to explain gravity. And don't worry, Garoben, a sea is still passing.
The first anime exclusive Yoma, and a rather uninspired one at that. Bomb is wearing what I assume to be fortune telling attire, although it looks like she just grabbed a sheet and called it a day. I've seen Scooby Doo monsters more inspired than this overall design. The disappointment doesn't stop there, as Bomb comes equipped with an equally uninspired name, being a pun off the word palm, a thing used for rating fortunes. Overall, I foresee this one being forgotten with her lackluster design, boring power set, and only notable act of villainy was letting Umino get to second base, which has been illegal since the Nuremberg Trials. While it may be a bit of a stretch to consider Fru Rao a monster in the typical sense, the Dark Kingdom certainly does. To me, she simply looks like a grey-skinned woman in a blue dress, but maybe my standards for her monster are a bit too high. This blooming villain uses flowers to sap her victims of their energy, so naturally her power is to shoot dark energy from her mouth. What, really? No plant-related moveset? Her name is a pun off the Japanese word for flower, Furawa, whereas her name is Furau. Not only can I barely pronounce it, but the fact that she is only tangentially related to flowers is a bit of a letdown. Hope this one withers away from my memories. D tier. In case it wasn't apparent from her overall design, this scaly scamp is surely the first monstrous design created by the anime team. If it wasn't obvious from her overall design, Igoro's name is derived from Iguana. While this still image of her really doesn't do her much justice, she is quite terrifying once you see her in motion. Despite lacking any particular powers of no other than turning her thralls into reptile monsters, which serves no functional difference from other thralls, but at least it's visually different, Igara stands as a somewhat memorable villain, even with a somewhat basic overall design, but it serves its purpose within the episode. As a bonus, I wanted to briefly mention the Chinellas, which are somehow creepier than their master. She's going to slither in that seat. I might be a little bit biased when it comes to Kirin, as she is the villain of one of my favorite standalone episodes of the entire arc, so please bear with me here. While it's not lost on me that a giant bat lady with supersonic powers isn't exactly the most original idea, it blends rather well into the overall plot for her particular episode. There are some genuinely tense moments where Kirin is allowed to be an intimidating monster, without that tension being deflated by the mere presence of Sailor Moon, as she spends time stalking a defenseless character. Her name is a reference to Siren from Greek mythology, who has nothing to do with bats or sound at all, but it's a one-to-one -one translation of the name. My own bias aside, she's a great overall Yoma design, very indicative of what is to come. However, she is outclassed by some of the better Yoma designs. A well-deserved B tier. For bat, I guess. While some Yoma tend to be a bit more subtle with their inspirations, Dorella is a child's first illusion. For starters, her name is simply a pun off of Cinderella, which is the name of the contest she and Jadeite set up to steal energy, the Cinderella Caravan. And she has a glass-like skin a la Cinderella's shoe. They went all out with the theming on this one, but man oh man what an ugly design. She looks more like Norse Feratu than an evil Cinderella. Her main method of attacking is shooting some sort of webbing that encases her victims either in a web or ice. It does both. I absolutely enjoy the episode she's the villain for, but not for anything she contributes. Not much to say about Dorella other than she missed the ball. F tier. D 
Given my previous statements on Yoma that for all intents and purposes are just women at a sorority Halloween party, you would think that I hated Remua. While she is definitely not that unique of a design, these small facial details given actually make her seem a little bit scarier than, say, Balm. Where she shines, however, is with her unique time manipulation abilities which offer a bit more than the typical fight fanfare we're accustomed to by this point. Her name is an anagram of the Japanese word for alarm, which is Aramu, which is once again related to her theming of time. While easily a forgettable design, Remua proves that given enough time, even a boring Yoma may prove to be entertaining in some regard. A solid C. I'm really not sure where to begin with Kaigon. For starters, I have no clue what her name is even supposed to be a reference to. Beyond that, I find her entire design to be painfully forgettable. Not even in a humorous way like some other bad Yoma designs, she looks like Morga's long-lost cousin without anything going for her. Now, I don't blame them for making her design so generic. After all, she exists just to die in lieu of Jadeite. But that's hardly a valid excuse given that every single Yoma is created just to die. No powers to speak of and no unique design elements makes for probably the most creatively bankrupt Yoma in the entire series. If I could go lower than F, Kaigon would be there. This Yoma's name is simply the Japanese word for dream backwards. Dorimu becomes Morido. And while I can't pronounce it, I have to say this Yoma's design is an absolute dream come true in terms of ambiance. She really captures the daydream-like quality she's supposed to be corrupting. For instance, she is designed to look like a fairy tale princess complete with her own apple. This disguise is used in the same vein as her own powers, as an allusion to lull victims into a false sense of comfort, only for that to be taken away once her corrupted true form is revealed, looking more like a creepy toy doll, reflecting the fakeness of her illusions. Her power to manipulate dreams is also an extremely interesting one, although it's more akin to an illusion than it is to Freddy Krueger. All in all, Marido can rest easy knowing she is one of the best designed Yoma, sitting comfortably within the A tier. While it may be far more enjoyable dunking on the occasional terrible Yoma design, there are certain occasions where I enjoy the design far more than I have any right to, and Thetis is such a design. This entire list was actually inspired by this particular Yoma, yet when it comes to actually articulating my thoughts, I seem to fall short. Her name is derived from Greek mythology after the sea nymph Thetis, who is most commonly known as the mother of Achilles. Unlike previous references to myth seen within the series, Thetis has some similarities between her mythological counterpart. For starters, one of her powers is the manipulation of water, which she uses to great effect. A common depiction of nymphs is to give them control and mastery of an element, although this has no actual mythological basis. Another similarity of note is her love or attachment to a human king. The nymph Thetis was married to a mortal king, Peleus, whereas the Yoma is in love with the heavenly king, Jedi. Interestingly enough, she seems to be the only Yoma with her own agency. As silly as that agency may be, it goes a long way into developing her as one of the more memorable Yoma. I was originally going to sing Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go On, but my vocal range is worse than my pronunciation of the Japanese language. Rest assured, Thetis gets an S tier. Going from one meaning of love to another, may I introduce Tasuni whose name is an anagram of the Japanese word for tennis, tenisu becoming tesuni. The love I have for this design is the same as love in tennis terminology. There's absolutely nothing. 
She is the first in a long line of object-themed monsters of the week, which have the tendency to become rather absurd. And while Tasuni walks the fine line between menacing and goofy, at least she isn't just an anthropomorphic tennis racket, so she has that going for her. But anytime your diabolical plot is to turn your enemies into giant tennis balls, you might want to reevaluate your life. This episode is an overall fun one, and Tasuni is rather indicative of the zany monsters that are to come in later seasons, which spares her from forgettability in my opinion. But still not spared from the D-tier. Game, set, match, to Sunni. This dryad looking Yoma is the first of many, and I mean many, plant-based antagonists we will be seeing throughout the series. There's four on this list alone. What does Pedasus have going on for her that makes her stand up from the rest? Well, as strange as it sounds, she looks far more bestial, more akin to a Keelan than a plant. Think of a night elf of Mortal Warcraft and you kind of have the design. In terms of design, Pedasus has a lot going on for her. From her bark-like chest piece to her root-like feet, she just screams nature's vengeance. Her naming convention, however, is just a bit more strange. A Pedasus was a hat worn by travelers within ancient Greece, which has very little connection to the Yoma other than being the object she spawned from within the episode. While she doesn't pass through the B tier, but overall I'd say I'm fauna of this design. But I better end this bit, Flora, make a fool of myself. If you have severe arachnophobia, it may be wise to skip this entry completely. Well, on the other hand, if you're an extreme arachnophile, I also suggest you skip this entry completely. In all seriousness, Widow is just that, a spider girl, which happens to both be unique and completely boring all at the same time. The concept of taking a creature and merely adding cleavage to it and calling it a day's work is nothing new. Hell, this list already had one. Yet this concept is even less unique within Japan, as Jorogumo is an incredibly popular yokai. Although I have my reasons to believe this yoma is actually based off a Greek myth, that being the myth of Arachne. Within the myth of Arachne, the titular woman is a skilled weaver and challenges Athena to a sewing contest. And to make a long story short, Arachne turns into a spider. The story of this episode follows a similar plot structure to that myth, so the spider motif isn't entirely an unwelcome one. It's just such a boring overall design, and her fight with the Senshi is among the shortest in the entire series. After all, she's a spider that picked a fight with a group of people who have the powers of a can of raid and fire. What did she expect? Bottom of the list with you. Sometimes you don't need a deep and intricate design based on ancient mythologies to be a great Yoma, and Cameron proves that a picture is truly worth a thousand words. Unfortunately for you all, I get paid per word, so here's a few about this calamitous camera. In terms of design, there's actually quite a bit to unpack here, despite the fact that, at first glance, she appears to be a purple woman with long shoulders. But Cameron is designed to be reminiscent of a model, particularly a fashion model, hence the unique clothing design. That eye that comes out of her hand when she takes a picture is such a creepy yet subtle touch. I can't help but love it. There's something I always enjoyed about Yoma being perversions of their victims' passions. It's ironic in a sense that always seems satisfying no matter how many times I see it. And this is perhaps the best usage of that concept executed within this particular arc. Her powers were rather unique as well, being able to fire bursts of energy that send victims into a photograph dimension. Her defeat was also a pivotal moment for Sailor Moon's character growth within the anime. A picture-perfect A-tier contender. Cameron is delighting you always. I think two people got that joke. This Yoma is one of the rare examples of having absolutely no clue what its name was a reference to, and a simple Google search actually gave me the answer. Jamu is the name of a French company that made porcelain dolls in the late 1800s, and as such happens to be the focal point of... What should I call them? 
the victim of the week, the entire episode's victim of the week's backstory. This Marilyn Manson looking mannequin is just so unnerving to look at. Perhaps it's just the uncanny valley, but it looks not quite monster and not quite human. Jamu has a rather strange skill set to boot, being able to turn its limbs into projectiles, as well as being able to regenerate said limbs. The only way to stop it is ironically not that little necklace that looks like an obvious weak point, but its foot. This Yoma receives high praise from me, no strings attached, B tier. One may be forgiven if they were to believe that this Yoma derived its name from the star of the same name within the constellation of Leo. However, that is not the case, as it's simply called Regulus due to being a regular old lion Nephrite picked up from the Tokyo Zoo. A palette swap of a real-life animal doesn't magically constitute it as a different creature, let alone a monster. We don't consider albinos monsters, so what makes a pink and blue lion one? It's so forgettable, Sailor Moon doesn't even defeat the thing. You heard me right. This thing is the only Yoma to not be defeated. Probably because the Senshi would have felt bad attacking a captive lion. An obvious inclusion into F tier. Wonder Twin Powers Activate. Shape of scantily clad bikini alien. Similar to different Yoma we have encountered so far, Castor and Pollux still derive their names from the mythological characters of the same name, best known as the constellation Gemini, the twins. Apart from being twins, the two share very little in common, to the point where the entire purpose of naming them is only to convey that they're twins, and Nephrite had a thing for constellations. The two have a rather striking, complementary, and contrasting design, which helps make them stand out, although, ironically, I couldn't tell you which one is Castor and which one is Pollux. When the two Yoma are paired together, they can form an unbreakable bond, which makes them immune to all attacks the Senshi throw at them. They can even use the same moves that were used against them. Sadly, the whole of the fight is completely undermined within about two minutes, as the twins start bickering and are swiftly defeated. The best thing about this duo is the episode in which they appeared. While not enhanced by their presence in any meaningful way, it has cemented their place within the series. Nephrite spent the whole goddamn episode hyping these two up as his most powerful Yoma, only for them to barely last any longer than Widow had. Should've just sent in Regulus, at least he's undefeated. C tier for both of them. The first folkloric Yoma that isn't based on Greek mythology, and they wasted it on this. I'm torn when it comes to Yasha, as she has a lot going for her. In interesting design and mythological connections to Hinduism and Buddhism, yet despite all of that going for her, Yasha amounts to absolutely nothing. Her name is just the Japanese word for Yaksha. Although due to it being a Hindu spirit, Yaksha are the male form and Yaksini are the female, but gendering has never really gotten in the way of naming convention in this series before. Yaksha are generally considered to be benevolent spirits within India, yet the depiction here is far from it, and that has to do with it being the Japanese interpretation of this spirit. Buddhism having its origins in India incorporates a lot of myths from before its inception within its own. This is a fairly common practice from nearly every single religion. The deities that were yet to be incorporated within its own canon tend to either get tossed to the wayside, mixed in with other myths, or worse, demonized. And luckily for the Yaksha, all three happened when they were incorporated within Japan's distinct Buddhist sects. Yaksha were confused with Rakshasa, cannibalistic spirits, which over time merged and became syncretic with Oni, hence the design sporting a Hanya mask. Actually, it's why Yasha's entire design is based off of No. Now, you may be saying to yourself, that's all fascinating, but what does this have to do with the Yoma and Sailor Moon? And to be honest, very little. Yasha appears and dies almost instantly, 
There's really not much else to say other than its design. Honestly, one of the biggest letdowns in terms of wasted potential. Landing her within the D tier. While it may be cheating to include three different Yoma in this entry, these three peas in a pod are practically interchangeable to the point where they could have easily been one singular Yoma, and no one would have batted an eye. I'm sure the only reason there are three of them is to make Nephrite seem more powerful than he really is. Jupiter killed him without even trying in the manga. There really isn't too much to say about them, really. Suzuran means Lily of the Valley, Hosenka means Garden Balsam, and I'm still trying to deduce what exactly Grape means. Each Yama has a corresponding ability, Sonic Waves, Explosive Seeds, and Vine Impalement. While neat, if these abilities were all found within one single Yoma, I'm sure it would have been a far more memorable encounter. As far as design goes, they're all rather serviceable, looking like flower ninjas, or I suppose in Grape's case a fruit ninja. You know what, I don't really think I like them all that much now. C tier for the lot of them. Taking one look at Gason, and you can immediately tell he's about as radical in extreme 90s as a design can possibly get. For my younger viewers, Gason is straight bussin' no cap. That's how dated he looks. Honestly, you couldn't remove the 90s from this design even if you tried. While their overall design doesn't look bad, it's so indicative of that time period it was conceived in, I can't help but giggle whenever I see his little power glove and joystick. His name is derived from the Japanese word for Game Center, often abbreviated as Gason, sporting a rather underwhelming power set that simply involves a craned hand and a hammer. His abilities are kind of tame for someone who is supposed to introduce us to the start of a new major threat within the Seven Great Yoma. But being the greatest of the Goombas still makes you a Goomba at the end of the day, and Gason isn't that much different. Not really all too interesting when an ancient prehistoric evil specializes in crane games and whack-a-mole. It really doesn't sell us on the whole premise here. Overall, a neat design, just terribly executed. C tier. My name is Boxy. What an absolutely strange Yoma from an even stranger episode. His name is based on a pun of the word priest, that is, Bokshi, which happens to be the first two syllables of the word boxing in Japanese. Boxingu. While I'm entirely convinced that the staff created the name as soon as they knew a priest was in the episode, and worried about the design after the fact, they could have done worse. Describing Boxy sounds like a setup to a very bad joke involving a priest, a boxer, and an eagle. They clearly put in a bit of imagination when designing this guy, instead of simply making him a big beefcake monster and slapping boxing gloves on him. Well, the design isn't functionally more than that, but still I digress. There may actually be a little more to the overall design than I'm letting on, so let me talk about my stupid theory on this guy. Within the series, all the seven great Yoma tend to turn the person's passion or hobby into a corrupted and evil power, and yet we have this random priest who becomes a boxer. Given that the average Japanese citizen knows next to nothing about priests despite their prevalence within the country, it may be safe to assume that the staff sort of based their priest off of one within pulp culture, namely from the blockbuster film The Exorcist, namely from the character of Father Karas, whom used to be an expert boxer and was even within the recent release sequel film, The Exorcist 3, which would have hit Japanese theaters around a year or two before the release of this episode. The main antagonist of the film series is a demon named Pazuzu, which, while having little to do with its mythological counterpart, is indeed a real Mesopotamian deity. Depictions of Pazuzu have been fairly consistent throughout history, and almost any encyclopedia referencing him would include a similar description. A combination of of animal and human parts, bird talons for feet, two pairs of wings, 
a scorpion tail, and a snake for a penis. That being stated, I'm upset that Boxy was never given the latter two appendages to really make that reference apparent, but I think there's enough commonality that it's at least plausible. Otherwise, it's just an eagle boxing monster for no apparent reason. And I don't even like this Yoma that much, nor this episode, and I've gone on for quite a while. Boxy's a D-tier Yoma, and I'm moving on. One thing I enjoy about this particular Yoma is just how inline it looks with other Toku franchises. It's rather easy to imagine Bumbo in a Zhu Ranger episode, more so than any other Yoma on this list. He just looks like a man in a big, goofy-themed rubber suit, and I adore it. His name is based off the Japanese word Bunboku, which means stationary supplies. Given his main weapons are a giant pair of scissors and a protractor, at least the naming is on theme. His abilities, however, aren't all that interesting, merely being able to slash at people and launch his comically large arts and crafts utensils. At the end of the day, most people remember this episode not because of Bumbo, but because of a picture of Ami eating a burger. I suppose he has all the tools to put that picture in a scrapbook. B tier. Well, if you thought my Japanese pronunciation was terrible, wait until you hear my Hebrew, as happens to be the case with this particular Yoma. Bina has its origins within the Kabbalah, which is an entire subject unto itself, but for the sake of simplicity, it's a school of thought within Jewish mysticism. I'm really selling it short, and I know I like to go into detail on these things, but the Kabbalah is so dense and requires not only intricate knowledge of itself, but intricate knowledge of the Torah as well. Bina is a reference to the third Sephirot, or emanation, in the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, which is its own esoteric thing in of itself, but represents understanding. Bina is also associated with femininity, although it doesn't have its roots within the Kabbalah, and more or less the occult and Thelema. And at the end of the day, I just wanted to talk about a monster from a children's anime, and not mysticism and cult symbolism. What I'm getting at is that the background behind the name is loosely related to why the Yoma looks like an angel. Bina lies more on the Kirin side of the naming spectrum than anything. What really saves Bina, however, is her skill set which allows her to draw objects that become real, which just enhances the overall quality of the encounter. Overall, a solid Seraphim who needs not be afraid of her overall ranking. B tier. It's certainly been a while since we've had a boring Yoma design, and Riku Kaidar certainly ticks all the criteria. Her design is 70% go-go boots, and it's by far the most interesting part of her design. Her name is from the Japanese term Rikoke, which refers to someone who studies science or engineering as opposed to practical Yoma design. Her skill set is a significant improvement, but when you start with the bar so low, you're bound to achieve something. Her powers, while varied, ultimately boil down to magical vials of science doing things. She can reflect attacks, but we've seen that move once or twice. Overall, the inspiration behind the name was taken a bit too literally, as there's no artistic drive behind this design, and the only thing she accomplishes is keeping the Sigma male Matoki off his grind set. It's looking like she might have to drop out with this F I'm about to give her. Not only does this Yoma have a name that I can actually pronounce, he also comes preloaded with the first double pun we've seen thus far. What can't this crazy-eyed little guy do? GG at first glance is a relatively easy to understand pun from the word, well, GG, which is used to refer to old men. Given that this is Ray's grandfather, the naming convention checks. But the name is also a reference to Shishi, which are the stone lions which are often stood at the entrances of palaces or shrines. That's all there really is to the joke. It's an old man turned into a Shishi. 
The fact that they are used to guard the entrances to shrines and that a Shinto priest was turned into a destructive version of these guardians is just oozing with enough irony to be satisfying. While its moveset isn't all that complex, Gigi makes up for it in Savagery, being the most beast-like Yoma we've seen in a while. Just a shame it looks so damn goofy. Still earning a spot in B tier though. It seems the anime team noticed the lack of monstrous Yoma and decided to give us two of them back to back. For some reason. While these designs do help to break the monotony when placed back to back, some of the flaws start to show through. Baken derives its name from the Japanese yokai Bakineko, which are among a multitude of cat-based yokai, a more popular subgenre than one may expect. This one being a literal ghost cat. And that's about where the comparisons start and end. He is named after a cat demon, and he is a cat demon. I can't even break down how his abilities or references to Baki Neko, since he doesn't do anything within the entire episode. I enjoy the episode for what it is, shying away from the typical formula to give the spotlight to Luna of all characters. It was also a pleasant surprise to be led to believe that the cat's owner was the last Yoma, only to be hoodwinked with it being the cat, Rat Butler. A reference nobody really understands anymore, so... From now on, I'm going to call this character Bakin Phoenix. But with a name like that, it doesn't save him from the D tier. Taking a small little detour from our regularly scheduled program, I wanted to touch base with three particular Yoma that appear only within a video game. The most notable thing about these three Yoma is that they actually share a distinction with Morga due to being designed by none other than Naoko Takeuchi herself. Depending on your interpretation of the Sailor Moon canon, these three goobers have more legitimacy than other Yoma just due to that factoid. Their naming convention also makes them quite difficult to search online, thanks to their names just being a single Japanese word repeated twice to on an omnipiac effect. Hopefully no other franchise names their entire power system based off a similar dynamic. Oh, only the most popular manga of all time does. Great. If you have an encyclopedic knowledge of Devil Fruit, chances are you will already know what these three Yoma do. Hirahira or Flutter, it's just a lady with a whip. Muchi Muchi is an energetic bounce, well, that gives you front flip the clown. Goro Goro is the sound of thunder, and well, that's just mean. I'm really not gonna bother ranking them. There isn't much to discuss other than the fact that Naoko designed them. Contrary to popular belief, this Yoma was not named after a certain mid-2000s R&B musician of a similar sounding name, and instead named after a lake in Japan. That joke was a lot better in my head, but I already stuck to this bit, so it don't matter right now. Akan is a giant red crab man that I can practically smell the latex of, despite being, well, animated. Can I just say I absolutely love this design. It feels like the first time a human was turned into Yoma, and they turned into an evil version of themselves. Quite literally in this case, as the heroic Sentai Red Man gets turned into a rubber-suited menace. And they play this so straight. He even attacks with little green algae balls that actually grow in the lake of his namesake. I'm not really sure why so much effort was put into this particular Yoma, but I'm glad they did. A tier all day. While there certainly are a host of bad Yoma designs, I think this is the first instance of a host of people being turned into one. 
While it may be hard to decipher exactly what you're supposed to be looking at with this design, ironically, it's supposed to be the staff of a beauty salon. Mitsuami has to be one of the ugliest designs I've seen in a while. Its name is a direct reference to the word Mitsuami, which means braid in three strands, a hair technique that this design lacks. This barbaric barbershop quartet at least boasts an interesting power set, ranging from a giant hair dryer to a razor chainsaw, which keeps it from being completely unmemorable. She just failed beauty school in more than one way. D tier. Shako Kai is another classic example of a Yoma that, for all intents and purposes, should check off all the boxes to score rather high. Yet, I find her completely forgettable in the grand scheme of things. Her name is actually another double reference, coming from the term Shako Kai, meaning society, while also being a pun due to sounding like Shako Gai the word for giant clam, a naming convention befitting of a Pokemon. This Yoma carries an aristocratic air to herself, while supporting the whole clam motif in a rather visually pleasing way. Unlike several other Yoma, her episode would have been completely different had she been replaced with another from this list. Yet, I don't really care for this particular design in any meaningful way. Her abilities are somewhat lackluster, involving encasing people in wax, a gimmick we've seen already been done before to similar forgettable effect with several more awful monsters. At least she looks better than Dorella. I might be a bit shellfish, but I expect more from my Yoma designs, so I'll clam up and give middling reviews to our Maiden Mollusk. D tier. Like searching for an object in a snowstorm, I'm struggling to find anything of relevance with this Yoma. It's been a while since the design has been so brazingly bad. Blazar manages to put the abominable in abomination. I know that makes no sense, but she has snowmen for a bra. Kudos to the design team for at least not making an utterly generic ice monster. But did you really have to add faces to the snowmen? This Yoma is also stupidly powerful compared to some of the others we've seen within the series, being able to not only control the cold by flash freezing people, but she causes an earthquake during the skiing competition and they wasted it on this thing. Well, at least you can't say she's forgettable like several other designs, but this one is just so painfully bad that I think I'm forced to let it go to the frozen depths of hell. A rather infamous entry in terms of lack of concrete information on it. There isn't even an official English spelling of their name, and the Japanese are just as confused. In terms of what their name is a reference to, you're guess is as good as mine, all we really know is this is one singular Yoma name and the male isn't Zoyran and the female isn't Geller. To Zoyran Geller's credit, they at least look like figure skaters pretending to be monsters, while I think I would have preferred monsters with skates. Did these two even have any abilities other than skating? All the tension from this episode was from Kunzite anyhow, so... It's easy to forget about these two. D tier, I suppose. While a vast majority of people watching this probably have absolutely no clue why I'm including this goober, but I skipped episode 40's Lake Yokai, it's for the simple fact that this list is strictly Yoma. The Dark Kingdom seemingly had no clue that such a creature even existed, and thus puts her outside the Yoma realm and out of this list. This jolly green ghoul, however, is a Yoma, and thus gets a mention. There's really not much to break down, unlike other wastes of ink like Kaigon. They didn't even bother naming 
renaming this one between its introduction and getting kicked by Sailor V. This Yoma exists, and for that sin alone, F tier. While arachnophobia is a common fear, a lot less people have a phobia of butterflies. So the natural instinct to take one and fuse it with a sexualized anime girl to create a monster is less a natural one and more or less the sick fantasy of a single lepidopterist on staff. Papillon derives her name from the French word for butterfly, which is papillon. Given Naoko Takeuchi's love for the French language, I am surprised this isn't a more common naming theme. This female common writer reject isn't all too impressive and sports an equally uninspired repertoire. While being able to fly using her big Dumbo ears is unique, her only method of attack is turning her hand into a scythe, making her, like, what, the fifth Yoma to do so? D tier for this one. You have to give it to the anime team for having this much restraint. After all, they went through 36 different Yoma designs before they resorted to using a ninja. While my previous sentiment on using stock villain archetypes applies here as well, I can't bring myself to hate Oniwa Bandana. After all, I rather like the design, and this particular Yoma actually displays a little bit of personality at the very least. Being a ninja, she comes equipped with the typical fanfare of the occupation, Shuriken and Shadow Clones. If you've watched a single episode of Boruto's Dad, you'll have the general concept down. Her name is actually a bit of an interesting one, being a direct reference to the secret agents of the Tokugawa Shogunate, called the Oniwaban. These guys appear in a lot of different media, but I know them best from Rurouni Kenshin, as well as the word bandana which the character wears. While not the most imaginative Yoma on the list, Oniwa Bandana is extremely competent in what her design set up to do, and as such gets high enough praise from me. She gets an extremely undeserved A. There are very few Monsters of the Week that live up to their moniker, and very few others exceed the expectations placed upon them. The DD Girls are perhaps the culmination of the entirety of the anime's monster design philosophy. Being these sexy yet utterly terrifying beings that actually manage to do their job. They have the highest on-screen main character kill count of any antagonistic force within the series. Despite there being five of them, the bar for threatening is so low any kill count not in the negatives is considered a blessing. The group is referred to as the DD Girls. What that entirely means isn't really relevant, although I suppose it has something to do with D-Point, their home. They don't even have individual names. Even official sources simply number them. So there isn't a convenient Inky, Pinky, Kinky, Blinky, and Clyde to follow here when referring to individuals within the group. Although Inky is clearly the leader of the bunch, I suppose that somehow bust size determines strength in Moth Girls. What's even more strange is that their name is actually a reference to the J-pop group CC Girls, who, oddly enough, were once called DD Gaps. Why they decided to make such a reference, I couldn't really say. I absolutely adore these pastel palleted moth girls and bestow upon them the highest honors I can give a Yoma, S tier. With that final entry being closed, that concludes our explanation of every single Yoma within the series, Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon excluded. This list was a lot of fun to research and to work on, so I hope you all enjoyed it. Sorry about the massive delay.